to the September 18, 2008 regular meeting of the Lake Forest City Hall, City Council. Uh, tonight the invocation will be, will be read by Chaplain Jeff Hetchell from OCFA. Is he here? No. No OCFA? No. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, would you like to do it? I'd be happy to. Father God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for our constitutional rights for free speech. We thank you, Lord, that we can meet in safety. And we ask you, God, that you are with us tonight and help us guide our decisions. Let our city council emulate exactly what you intended. Lord, let us be the ears and the heart of the people to vote as they would want us to vote and to conduct ourselves as wish they would wish we would be conducting ourselves. Pray you, God, that you give us tempered speech, that we are quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to be angry, and that everything tonight, Lord, be to your glory. In your precious name, amen. Amen. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by, do we have any Boy Scouts? No, okay, will be led by me. Please rise. <clears throat> Hand over your hearts and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda is the closed session report. Do you have anything to report? Uh, there's no action to report tonight, Mr. Sir. No action to report. Have we ever had any action to report? We have several times in the last few months. I must have missed it. <laughs> All right. A uh, report from our student liaison. We have a new student liaison tonight from El Toro High School, Stefano Polito. Welcome, Stefano. Hi. Um, so first I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Stefano Polito. I'm a senior currently at El Toro High School. Uh, I play varsity tennis, and I'm taking over Sarah Dahlstrom's position from last year. And um, I'm really happy to have the position. So school has been in session for three weeks, and so far everything's been running very smoothly. We had our new student orientation over the summer where we provided tours for the new freshmen. We took them around campus, showed them all the facilities, everything that they needed to know. Um, and we also taught them some of El Toro cheers so that they can feel more at home and welcomed at the football games. So speaking of football, El Toro has been performing very well. In their game against Tribuco Hills High School, they earned a well-earned um, a well-deserved victory the night of our Charger Mania dance. In fact, one of our players, Austin Stover, was named um, the Offensive Player of the Week. Uh, our Charger Mania dance, which is the most uh, sought-after gym dance of the entire year, uh, um, had an attendance of over 1,000 El Toro students, um, and we also had DJ Griff perform at the dance as well. We had our first fall pep rally last Friday, which was a huge success. The theme of the pep rally was the military, with each of the different student sections being a different branch of the military. We had a military recruiter come and speak to the students, and we showed a film rewind of all of our fall sports, and then we hosted a student game of musical chairs. So as for future events, the date for our homecoming has been set for October 13th, 2018. Our theme for this homecoming is Alice in Wonderland. We are prepping for our homecoming halftime shows. We're preparing our ticket sales. We already have all of our nominations for the homecoming king and queen. And other upcoming events, our canned food drive is coming up right around the corner, and we expect to perform just as well, if not better, than previous years. That's all that I have for today. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, go Chargers. Well, thank you very much for being here. I think, didn't you collect over 100,000 cans last year? I know, it's an incredible achievement. Uh, we're now up to the public comment uh, section of the agenda. As a reminder, if you would like to participate, please fill out a blue speaker card, turn it into the city clerk, and your name will be called. Madam Clerk, have we had any requests to speak? Yes, Your Honor. Sunny Morper, followed by Tony Hayes. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening to each of you and all here tonight. Uh, the purpose for being here is primarily to indicate that the City Council Candidate Forum has been scheduled and confirmed for October 4th. Each of you should be receiving a copy of this flyer 
that has been is being distributed. I know it's on now on my own website, which is uh, Sunny Morper for Council. I would hope that you would put it on yours, and that the city might be able to do something along those lines as well. It should be an interesting evening. Two of our uh, new commissioners are going to serve as moderators. One of which. Uh, has done it often at the Sun and Sail Club, and I think that we'll find that he's uh, uh, going to do a, a terrific job along with his co-host as, um, as moderators. One other thing that I'd like to mention while I have just a few seconds here, and that is in terms of the, in terms of the uh, campaign itself, I've had the opportunity to speak with each of you privately pertaining to my interests associated with the City Council. I've learned a great deal. I know the acrimony that's occurred in the past. Uh, some things carry over. I would hope that you would join me and instruct your supporters that in, as I have, that in no way, shape, or form will you condone anything that besmirches the integrity of any of the candidates and that in so doing we have a civil discourse relative to the issues, experience, and solutions that might be presented fairly among everyone. So with that in mind, I can assure you, as I indicated, I've instructed those who I know would be avid supporters and have said that I will disavow any nonsense associated with supporting me while bad-mouthing uh, my opponent, opponent. I hope you'll pass the word as well. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Next. Tony Hayes, followed by Gada Gantus. Welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Gardner and members of the City Council. Um, I'm a relative foreigner here. I'm not a resident of Lake Forest. I'm, I actually live in San Clemente. Um, but I'm here this evening to ask you to support transferring responsibility of operating and maintaining the toll roads to Caltrans and disband the transportation corridor agencies. Uh, the TCA was founded in 1986 to build and operate toll roads. That is the only job they have. They're not really concerned as to whether toll roads are the best way to invest limited financial resources. They're financed with tax exempt bonds and these bonds have been refinanced from 2040 to 2053, which basically means that we're going to be paying tolls uh, for eternity. Uh, part of the reason they don't make much money is because they pay themselves very handsomely. Um, the CEO has total compensation last year of $412,000, and their next six executives have salaries, have compensation from $245,000 up to $336,000. So that's where a lot of the money goes. Other money goes towards um, supporting. Um, uh, other ways of, of trying to encourage support for the toll roads rather than actually doing anything to, uh, to, to, to maintain the toll roads themselves. Um, the, the income comes from uh, both toll fees and, quote, development fees, which we all pay whether we use the toll roads or not, because every time there's any construction, uh, there is a de quote, development fee, in other words, a tax on, on construction. And the reason we don't need more toll roads is because there is going to be a revolution in transportation which will greatly increase the capacity of both existing uh, limited access roads and arterial roads. Most cars uh, for sale now um, have active cruise control, which the Federal Department of Transpo Transportation says claims will increase uh, pa freeway capacity by 60 percent. And there are a lot of other technologies that are available. In, in addition, for arterial roads, there will be things like traffic signals controlled by artificial intelligence so that traffic will flow seamlessly through surface streets. All these things are going to happen in the next 20 years. We do not need more toll roads. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> as you may be aware, the council can't take action from items arising from public comments, but if one of my colleagues wants to raise this during 
general comments we could have this put on the agenda for future I would love to but I've been told that I'm four requested out of seven requested out of four items so I'm tapped out but I I would support anyone who who would like to put this on the agenda okay thank Got you Gada Gantus followed by Laura Smith welcome thank you uh, good evening we have a presentation some slides that are going to be passed out uh, my name is Gada Gantus I'm also uh, from San Clemente and there's going to be a little bit of a common theme throughout I think some of our presentations um, I'm here to talk about development fees which your city along with other cities in Orange County pay to the Transportation Corridor Agency uh, these fees are a form of tax and I would like to share with you some information that impacts Lake Forest as well as all of us as taxpayers in Orange County um, as my uh, colleague here mentioned back in the 80s the state legislature created the TCA um, as a joint powers agreement and their purpose was to finance design and build toll roads and then go away um, that was about 30 years ago and the uh, the way that they financed these toll roads was through revenue bonds development impact fees which we'll talk about a little bit the California Transportation Commission grants and state and local transportation uh, funds so in other words taxes and public money uh, what are the development impact fees and why should we care um, they are fees or taxes that are paid by residents through the city um, on any new home that is being built or that's being a home that's being remodeled there's also a fee that's paid on commercial space that's constructed uh, anything that that is going to benefit from the the toll roads um, in 1985 the TCA forecasted that almost 50 percent of the cost of the T of the roads is going to be financed through the de development impact fees um, in 19 from 1986 until March of this year the total amount collected in development impact fees is over 706 million dollars from the cities that participate in this program Lake Forest is one of them San Clemente is another one how much did Lake Forest pay during this time period they paid 37 million dollars so the, these are tax dollars that went out of the city and went to the TCA what could be done with these dollars had they stayed in the city Um, every year the development impact fees go through an automatic increase over 2% depending on if you're in the foothill eastern corridor or if you're in the San Joaquin Hills corridor there is no vote on these this was this was decided uh, many years ago and there's an automatic incre increase that is happening every year so again our taxes are going up and we're paying these development impact fees whether or not we're using the toll roads um, the taxes that are being collected by the TCA are, don't stop at the development impact fees we had 151 million in public funding that was collected during construction of the toll roads 1.1 billion of taxpayer bailout in 2008 we had development impact fees we have toll fees which continue to increase every year automatic increase every year um, Caltrans maintains the toll roads using our tax dollars so my point is that taxpayer money is being paid to fund the, the the toll roads which as he mentioned may not be needed if and many of us don't use and you're out of time thank you thank you uh, just for future benefit for anybody if you hand these in ahead of time we get a chance to study them and we can give it a, a better look than we can uh, during the actual discussion welcome my name is Laura Smith and I'm also from San Clemente and like she said we are kind of talking about the same thing and to further that the development impact fees that they've been collecting and they've been collecting year after year after year it's been 20 years and they have not even built a road despite this their debt has increased from 2.6 billion dollars to 6.4 billion dollars and they haven't built anything and she said they're not even maintaining the road and yet they have increased um, the 73 was a, supposed to be free two years ago it's still not free and yet now it's going to be in 2053 are we even going to be driving in 2053 I don't think so and yet they're patting themselves on the road saying that you guys all got a letter from them saying how they're doing such a good job and their ridership is up but they continue to pay their lobbyists to advertise that they to drive their roads 
Do you see OCTA advertising to drive the 5 over the 405? No. They don't have to pay to advertise what road to drive. You go on your Waze or your Google Maps or your Apple Maps and find out which road is going to get you there the fastest. But they spend a lot of money on their lobbyists or their consultants to tell you what road to take our tow road to drive. It's just a waste of money. This money they have sitting there that they say now they have a um, 1.6 something dollar billion dollars sitting there because they're not building anything. So they have accumulated all these development impact fees because they're not having to spend it right now, and so they can they spend it on that advertising. They also spend it on like the Economic Coalition, who they also are members. And they're wasting our money right now. And the Economic Coalition then is for the toll roads. They're telling people, yes, we want the toll roads. And now they are trying to push the toll road through San Clemente. And we are fighting it. I know it's not going to go through Lake Forest, but the toll road is not needed there. And they're also, what you guys w might be interested, they are trying to get into managed lanes on the 5 freeway. And it may possibly even come all the way up to the 405. That is one of the options. And it will take away two of the lanes. There's going to be, they're working on the 5 freeway. They're building a carpool lane. And they, they have their eyes, if it will come up this far, taking the carpool lane and making it into a managed lane, kind of like what they did in, to the 91 and they're going to do on the 405. And you're going to have to pay to drive. The TCA has no authority on the 5 freeway to be taking the freeway lanes and taking them and making the managed lanes, but they are trying to do this. And we just want everybody to be aware of this agency that has gone amok. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, followed by Dennis Walsh. Hi, good evening. My name is Michelle, and I just wanted to say a correction. Uh, Lake Forest has actually spent uh, $57,160,000 of money that's gone out of the city that we believe should have stayed with residents and businesses in Lake Forest to the TCA. The TCA is a JPA. They are supposed to review by their agreement the development fees annually. They have not been reviewing them. They've been automatically increased. We believe this agency has committed fraud against every resident in Orange County and this city in Lake Forest. That's why we're here this evening. The 73 was supposed to be free two years ago. They are nowhere close to paying it down. This is an agency where the CEO makes more than the President of the United States of America, and that doesn't even include his pensions. They are spending $3 million a year on lobbyists, and they have nothing new to say. Why are they spending so much money on this messaging? There are some nefarious things that go along with the money they're spending on those lobbyists that I don't have time to elaborate on this evening. But I'm sure Scott Voigt has been letting you know that the development fees have been discussed at this TCA meeting for the last few months, and residents are outraged that the, the Board of Directors is not reviewing them as required by the actual JPA agreement. So I think it's time when development fees are discussed in all cities, because let's face it, California is getting really expensive to live. Things are not working out for regular Californias. It's getting very expensive. This is one way that you can decrease the cost for housing, for development, keep the money in your cities. So we're really asking you tonight to take a look at your participation in the TCA, to take a look at their broken promises and how they've broken their trust over the last 20 years. Collecting development fees when you don't have a route on the legislative maps is not acceptable. This isn't a party. I know they enjoy golf and galas and they spend about $230,000 every three months for sponsorships, but that's not an acceptable use of taxpayer money as far as taxpayers are concerned. Um, so I guess, is that it? No. No? Okay. Um, so we're hoping, you know, it, this, this agency is just growing. They're trying to get outside of their jurisdiction right now. The J JPA agreement is very clear. They are to build a parallel to the five. So despite the Foothill Eastern Board building nothing in 20 years and still raking in all this money, 
they want to get onto the 5 Freeway. Uh, from Laguna Hills all the way down to the San Diego County line, they're proposing two additional lanes on each side of the 5 Freeway in a recent PSR submission to Caltrans, which is outside of their scope. Why is Caltrans studying economic discrimination? We have seniors on fixed incomes, we have students, we have got residents that are lower socioeconomic status. They can't afford the ever-increasing tolls. Meanwhile, the TCA does studies to see how much they can charge before they lose riders. We've just all had enough of it. We've got OCTA, we've got Caltrans. Why are we being taxed to the hilt by a redundant, useless agency? So I've actually brought, uh, that we got through a PRA, the fees that each city has spent. So you can see in here Lake Forest is the $57,160. And I brought it for you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I hope that you guys are going from city to city and giving this presentation to other cities. I, I hope you guys, that's your plan, is to, to visit several of the cities down here. Dennis Walsh, followed by Josh. Welcome. Hi. My name is Dennis Walsh. I do happen to live in Lake Forest. I've lived here for about 25 years. Actually, I kind of lived here before it was Lake Forest, too, so it was El Toro. I'm currently a member of the Saddleback Valley Unified School District uh, School Board. And in November, we have two people that are two positions that are going to be up for election. One of those positions is mine, and the other one is for someone who is not running for re-election. So we are definitely going to have a new person on the school board in November. And on October 24th, Wednesday, we are going to have a candidate's forum at the Saddleback Valley School District office. And so I urge people to go and listen to what the candidates have to say. Um, everybody's going to say they're a teacher, although I'm, I'm not a teacher. Uh, but they're all going to say they want safer schools and they want the best education for students and want to make our school district the best in the, in the state or the U.S. And that is not something that's new to us. We want to do that now. So please listen to what they have to say and, and ask them how are they going to do some of these things? Because a lot of people say things, you know, we want a lot of things, but we're not always able to do it. So please listen to the candidates, come to the forum. I don't know that it will be streamed, so you might have to actually go there. But um, just pay attention to what people have to say and elect the best people. Hopefully we'll just have one new person on the board and with myself returning. Thank you very much. Do you have the time for that? You told us the date, but what's the time? I don't know. I'd say seven, but I, I would check because I don't know that they have actually set the time yet. But normally it's around seven. Okay, thank but you. I'll come back next meeting and tell you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Josh, uh, followed by Bob Holtzclaw. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, one of the reasons my parents came from Cuba was because in the United States we're supposed to have First Amendment rights and rights to speak freely about religion. So integrity is a huge issue. When somebody lacks integrity, everybody in this room, not just Mr. Valentine, Chief Valentine, has a responsibility to public safety. So when somebody lacks integrity, when somebody's a danger to the community, they must be exposed. I'm fortunate that a lot of my wealthy clients live in a bubble and I have to do research. And when I research public records, it's crazy what I find out. So I started researching John Bush who frequent city council meetings. And it's crazy what I found. Per public records from Marion County, Florida, the current county where he lives in, and it's also corroborated by his Facebook page, which he hasn't blocked yet. You guys can go up there. He has records of exposing himself to minors several times, domestic violence. It's a pattern. He also has a pattern of being in financial distress. He's been arrested several times for worthless checks. Currently, he owes the Franchise Tax Board over $50,000. He also made public comments that he got $160,000 from Attic Nick. The Franchise Tax Board has reported to me he has yet to pay taxes on that. He also has several uh, DUIs. So that financial stress kind of makes sense, makes a pattern why he wants to shake down Adam for another $25,000. 
moral to this and my point that I want to make is like the Orange County shelter selling pit bulls to people who want to fight and kill people. They need to do their research and I encourage everyone here to use their resources. Look up public records. You know, the old Russian uh, parable. Trust and verify. And use the resources around you and feel free to contact me if you need help in figuring out how to research someone or if your kid's dating somebody you want to know them about. Contact me. I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you. Next. Bob Holdsclaw followed by Stan Yombo. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Bob Holdsclaw, resident of Lake Forest, and I want to thank the people from San Clemente to come out here uh, about the uh, the toll roads. Matter of fact, I think the CEO for the toll roads is doing a study in Europe uh, on uh, toll roads. Why? I don't know. Maybe you could just email it. Uh, it'd be a lot cheaper. But uh, anyhow, I'm here on uh, the Prop 6 uh, campaign, and uh, what we found out is on the 78 uh, uh, road out there in uh, uh, San Diego County, the contractors were out there, and they were handing out no on Prop 6 uh, signs. We also have photographs and everything else of them handing these uh, leaflets out. Now, they, they claim that... Uh, Cal Caltrans claims that they didn't have anything to do with it. However, we've got a picture of their, uh, the car parked on the side there of one of their managers uh, while the contractors were passing out the leaflets. So they apologized over the telephone and everything else. However, we don't accept their apology. We're taking this to court. This is a, uh, uh, you're actually breaking the law. You're using uh, public uh, employees on public time uh, uh, to do political work. Uh, even if it is not Caltrans itself, it's your contractors, they were told out there to pass out these leaflets. Uh, last, uh, Caltrans would, uh, made a little statement here. There's a footnote on the bottom of the page that you have. It says Caltrans is looking into the matter, uh, but uh, uh, it under, uh, understanding that uh, uh, these individuals were private contractors, not uh, uh, Caltrans employees. But the, one of the Caltrans individuals was parked on the side watching them do it. So he obviously was probably part of the whole thing. Um, you know, as far as the people from San Clemente that came up here, now you really have a dose of uh, what political hacks are all about. And I suggest that anyone sees Caltrans or to TCA uh, stopping traffic or anywhere handing out uh, no on Prop 6 deals, photograph them and uh, log it in the time, location, everything else, and then send it to us. Uh, we'd be glad to have it, and uh, we'll press charges. No thank yous. Thank you. And uh, who exactly is us? When you say sent to us, do you mean to you? The uh, Prop 6 uh, organization. Yes, I'm Prop 6. Okay, thank you. That's the gas tax. Stan Yambo, followed by Niki Mortazetti. Good evening, Mayor. I don't see Stan Yambo up there. I know. Who is this thank guy? Thank you. I know, right? I look good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Council member and staff, thank you. Well, my name is Stan Yambo. Start his time again. Start his time again. Thank you. My name is Daniel Morris of Lake Forest. Uh, I went to a meeting with an organization called Friends of Detainees uh, in Irvine, and they, are, they do a fantastic job. They visit all the detainees, uh, immigration detainees, actually. And one of them is basically uh, James, Le uh, James Music and the uh, Theo Lacey on or uh, City of Orange. Um, and last, week, last weekend, actually, I went to visit two of them, two of the detainees, and it was fantastic. Um, one of them actually was from Congo, and he was so pleased to speak to me in French and Lingala, which is a language uh, uh, speaking in Congo. Um, their stories are very interesting. I mean, true, they came illeg illegally in America, but they chose to come here because of the freedom of speech and the land of free that we advertise so well in America. So that's why they're here. True, they came illegally, um, 
but they want to have that uh, piece of pie that we have. And one of the saddest part is they send them in front of a judge with no lawyer, which is kind of violating our Fifth Amendment in America because we believe in our amendments, the Bill of Rights. And that's not fair to them. But anyhow, I'm not here to talk about what's legal or what's not. Uh, the greatest thing is just, you know, we need to give that gift of human contact to those people. They come in America, they are hoping actually they can leave here and work hard and become part of us, which I did myself when I came in America over 20 years ago. And when you listen to these detainees for immigration, they are fantastic. A lot of them believe in God. A lot of them are Christian. Some of them are not Christian. Some of them are so different countries. But again, they all have that dream of American dream that we all dream about. And for me, it was very overwhelming just to talk to some of them because they, they have a great story. Um, but again, uh, when you have time, go visit the front of our uh, detainees. If you have really a good heart, visit, visit these people. The gift of a human contact is very important. We cannot just put the barrier or build a wall. People have a reason why they come in America. Of course, if they don't follow the rules, yes. If they don't they break the law, it doesn't have to be an immigrant or a citizen. Whoever you are, if you break the law, I agree. But you need to be in front of a judge with a lawyer, someone who can defend you. That's one of the things I was trying to talk about. But I'm here to talk about the friend of uh, detainees, which is very important. For those who believe on the good book, the Hebrew chapter 13 uh, uh, verse 2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by the some have entertained angels without knowing it. Leviticus 19, 13, 34, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you are foreign in Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. Thank you very much and have a great day. Do you have uh, contact information for that I, group? I do. Uh, the webpage actually is friendsofocdetainees.org. I can give it to you when uh, you approach me on, on a break or something. So thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Niki Morizetti. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Good evening, Council. Um, I'm here today not only as a candidate but a resident. Um, I want to talk about a fair shot and a fair election. Um, I was recently informed that the only candidate forum um, being held or offered to the residents of District 2 is being moderated by a, cl a close friend um, of my opponent who happens to also serve on the board with my opponent on their HOA board. Um, I think Lake Forest politics needs to be ethical and I think the city has had enough of the acrimony and the infighting and the choosing sides. We all live in this city together um, and it needs to be transparent. Um, how can anyone think that a fair chance would be given or questions wouldn't be provided to my opponent ahead of the event. I truly hope that the people of Lake Forest take these candidate forums perhaps with a grain of salt now, as it seems like the cards are already stacked against a fair and free election. Thank you. Next. I had no further requests from the public, but perhaps Facebook? Uh, Facebook, we, we uh, stream this live on Facebook and we allow people to interact with us. Do we have any questions from Facebook? We have three comments, Your Honor. Okay. From G. Silva, comment to council, Lake Forest needs a Trader Joe's. Yeah. <laughs> Why can't there be a Trader Joe's like in Irvine? They have it in the same parking lot as Ralph's. I would like to hear an explanation of this. Thanks. Okay. City Manager, do you have anything to say about that? Is Carlo here? <laughs> Carlo's not here? We, uh, we couldn't agree with you more and, in fact, have for years uh, tried to interest Trader Joe's and um, uh, what's the other What's the other one? Oh, Mothers and the other one. A, a, no, not Sprouts. <laughs> Nothing against Sprouts. But uh, anyhow, the, what they do in their research is apparently we're the donut in their hole and they're worried about uh, if they locate here, that will cannibalize the uh, businesses in their other 
city. So we have pursued many of those people many times and are still pursuing them again. Uh, so it's not for lack of trying, but uh, each time we do, we come up with the donut in the whole analogy. But we continue to do it anyway. Sherry Anderson, comment to council. As a Lake Forest resident, I agree with the speakers. My taxes pay to build and maintain the roads, but then I also have to pay to use them. As the rates continue to rise, it's unfair to those who may need, the, need them to work but can't afford to use them. Yeah, well, and I hope uh, somebody who hasn't uh, filled up their quota will bring that up later in council comments. And Holly Aitken Weatherly, comment to council. Lake Forest needs a Trader Joe's. How can we make this happen? <laughs> she continues, is there anything that can be done about the overflow of cars being parked on residential streets from the apartment complexes that are allowing so many more people now to one unit? I have seen that there are some issuing parking permits for two cars and the neighboring residents are getting their overflow parking now. Example, Pittsford, Pittsford Drive and Vintage Woods are just a couple of streets with too many parked and stored cars. Thank you. Yeah, if you go on the city website and look up uh, in the search engine, go to permit parking, you'll find the instructions for your neighborhood and how to alert the city to the potential problem. And then the city has a whole procedure that we follow to uh, determine whether or not there's a problem and what, what to do about it. So city website, search engine, permit parking, and it'll tell you what to do. That's it. Okay, thank you. Did I say we were the only city in the country that allows this? Yeah, have I said that? I didn't say that tonight? Okay. We're the only city in the United States uh, that allows this, although it didn't, you've been working with other cities, so other cities are starting to do this as well? They're still working on it, not quite out there yet, still but the only one. yes. Slow down, I like saying that, so. <laughs> Uh, all right, tonight we're going to switch it up a little bit. And we're going to uh, combine the certificate of warrant, certification of warrant register along with other, all the other consent calendar items because I'm tired of saying the same thing twice. It just makes no sense. So I'm going to say it one time and it's going to... Has everybody got that? Got that? Okay. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted by one vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless members of the City Council, the public, or staff request specific items be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Are there any requests to pull an item from the consent calendar, colleagues? Uh, number five, number seven, number nine. Five. I like odd numbers. Five, seven, and nine. Now we know why you use up your quotas. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, number nine is a public hearing. Oh. Nine, five and seven. A anything else in the public? Have they asked to pull anything? No, sir. I, I'll move the remainder. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? That motion carries unanimously. Okay, then item number five, quarterly representative report, outside agency, boards, and commissions submitted by the acting city clerk and pulled by the mayor pro tem. Um, just want to briefly say I really appreciate these quarterly reports. We're getting more information than we ever did before on these uh, committees, and I think it's really important for us to make good decisions. We need to have this information. Um, today, on a side note, I was with Bob Holtzclaw today for Vector Control. They had a, um, a meet and greet and an informational um, day. It was like a two to three hours, really informative, and I highly recommend if the rest of the council can go at any time, I would highly recommend it. And it just it opens your eyes for, for how, how important vector control actually is for this county. So that's all I have for number five. Yeah, I agree. It's really nice having those reports and seeing what's going on in all the agencies, and it's good for the public informing you uh, of what's going on. So I assume you want to move them up. Uh, yes, I'll move the item. Second that. Second. Please vote. 
That motion carries unanimously. Item number seven, amendments to agreement for traffic engineering services with Hartog and Cabril Incorporated and Albert Grover and Associates submitted by Director of Public Works and the City Engineer and pulled by the Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. And, and by the way, sorry for calling number nine out. My, for some reason, my green agenda doesn't it's different. have. It's different than the. Yeah, it didn't have the number on this one. But anyway, so as far as number seven, I, I received a couple of questions from residents regarding this particular item about engineering services. So I was hoping Public Works could explain um, why we're spending the money. Is it all getting spent? Is it just to put it aside in case we need it? And what, where is exactly is it going to? Thank you, Mayor. Council members, be glad to. Uh, this is our on-call contract. So as a contract city, we, um, we get contracts uh, to provide the technical support that we need. In this particular case, we've had uh, two firms on board for the last three years. We're um, recommending that we extend their contracts for another year. Uh, in the one case of uh, Hartzog Crable, which has been um, our primary uh, consultant for traffic engineering services, they provide all the review services that come in from the developers. So developers pay for that. Um, and so it just depends on what level of, of use that we need. So it's an on-call service. We don't use it unless we need it. And developers pay for that. So development review, maybe if Nikasi comes in or something of that nature, it's a significant review for, for the traffic. Um, and then all, all the little development projects and little traffic things that come up also. Um, Doug Anderson, as you know, he's a, a uh, staff member. So he provides half-time support to staff, answers much of the ALF tickets. Been spending a lot of time on permit parking. He's the one who goes out at 3 a.m. and counts the cars. Um, so that's what we do with, with development review. We're budgeting about $150,000 is what we estimate based on past experience for that. Um, and then the staff support is about $125,000 worth uh, is what we estimate that, that we'll use. Again, these numbers are our budgeted already. So we're just doing the contracts to match with the budget. And then we have um, two more surveys that we know of. Or one is the um, we need to update our speed limit survey citywide. So that'll cost about forty to fifty thousand dollars to do that work. And then um, we've also uh, the council has budgeted additional monies for studies based on what might come out of uh, the traffic commission. So if we are tasked to do a study, um, the left turn um, um, phasing or not phasing, but permissive. Uh, thank you, uh, which is coming to the Traffic Commission at, at its next meeting. That was funded from last year's budget for that study. So there will probably be another study, such as permit parking, that we're working on that we might need professional services for. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll move the item. Second. Let me ask a question first. All things considered, you sure at the amount of money Doug Anderson gets, having him go out counting cars is the best use of our money? We can look into it more. Um, Doug doesn't charge us for a lot of that time. Oh, there's, there, there's reasons why, but Doug is wonderful, and he gives us a lot of extra oh, free, well, benefit. Free, I don't like free to is what I like about. To free, then I have no problem. He's a bad consultant in that respect, but um, he's great for the city. Okay, great. And that's a vote? That motion. Okay, we're now at the public hearing. Uh, point of the evening. I'll open the public hearing and receive the staff report on the annual review of development agreements submitted by city manager. Oh. Mayor, oh. members of the council, we have our report tonight from our assistant to the city manager, Louis Lacasella. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Before you this evening for consideration is the annual review of development agreements under state law and the terms of the development agreements. The city is required to hold a public hearing to, to conduct an annual review. The annual review covers only the activity occurring during the past fiscal year. During the review period, property owners are required to establish good faith compliance with the terms and conditions of the development agreements. Good faith compliance is established if the owner is in compliant with every term and condition of the agreement. This review process is conducted with support from our city attorney's office to ensure that it to ensure that the developers are in compliance with the terms of the agreements. The attached matrix to the report summarizes each act of development as the submittal date of this agenda item. So after conducting a review of each development agreement, staff is recommending the City Council find each property owner to be in good faith compliance with the terms of its respective DA. 
And with that, staff's available for any questions the city council or mayor, mayor, members of the public may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any public questions, comments? No, Your Honor. Facebook? No, sir. Okay. Then I'll close the hearing. And city council comments, questions, colleagues? Yes, I, I have a few, if you don't mind. Um, I, I've been getting a lot of um, emails, Facebook Messenger, Facebook messages, textbook, or text messages, phone calls, any way you, someone can contact me, I've been contacted, because of nails in tires. And this has been an ongoing problem we've had in Portola Hills for at least the last two to three years. I thought I would do a search on, on our Facebook page. We have a very involved and active group of people in Portola Hills. We have well over a thousand people that are actively engaged on the site. And I thought I would just do a search on nails and tires. And so I started copying and pasting the comments. And I had to stop at page 28. I mean, I actually had 28 pages that I had copied and pasted all these comments about people getting nails and tires. So I decided to narrow my search down to just this year. And just this year, there have been 130 comments because people are getting nails and tires. That doesn't include my text messages, my phone calls, my uh, separate emails, and, and messenger messages. Um, I think that's a problem. I think we've got a big problem here. And I'm not getting it just from Portola Hills residents. I'm getting it from Painted Trails and Hidden Ridge, which is on the other side of El Toro Road. So that's telling me that it's, I'm sure that there's a component that people are doing construction on their homes, you know, remodels and such. But this can't be all remodels. There, there is some, there needs to be some ownership from the developers. There, there, we have a really big problem. So the people, even from the Mission Viejo developments, Hidden Ridge and Painted Trails are asking me to come to our council and talk to the developers because they're getting nails in their tires along El Toro Road. Um, the additionally, we're getting a, some comments that there's been some um, excessive dust in the Baldwin development where they're doing the grading on the, um, is that the east side of, yeah, the south, southeast side of the development. Where you, You'll know it's where all the grading is happening. And also, we're, I'm getting requests from residents that, I know this is probably public works, but maybe we could work on light synchronization on Saddleback Ranch Road and Glen Ranch. The light to turn from Glen Ranch to turn left up Saddleback Ranch Road, it's, it's obviously off because of the construction, but the, the delays are a bit excessive. People sit there and wait a lot longer than they should be waiting. So if you can take care of that, yes, thank you. But back to my nails and tires. What can we do? Um, I have some, had some suggestions from Facebook. Um, someone who is a former retired military said that they would have inside their hangars when they were working on the, the planes, they would have a magnetic strip attached to the back end of each of the vehicles. So if somebody missed a nut or a bolt or whatever, they would just drive this vehicle in this huge hangar and scoop up all of the remnants that were left over from all over the, the tarmac. So, you know, there, there are obviously things that we can do, and I want to hear from staff, I want to hear from the developers, what can we do to fix this? Because I'm no, it's no joke. We have had hundreds and hundreds of complaints about nails and tires. It's one thing if it's just a couple. I've had two, my husband's had two, my neighbors had six across the street, the other neighbors had four, the other ones had three. We got a problem. Okay, this isn't this isn't actually part of the developer agreement, doesn't say, right. but it is a right. an issue arising from the developer action. So, right, this isn't related to the review of the development agreements, but I just that figured it would be a good time. This to is a good opener, though, and so we internally have been talking about this for quite some time. It is extremely difficult to track a nail back to a de certain developer. And so we understand that. We understand there's a lot of frustration, though, and so we don't want to ignore that either. And so we've been talking about doing some additional sweeping. We've also talked about adding the metal bar to the street sweeper to try to pick up any metal debris that may be on the roadway. We're also talking with the developers. Um, in the past, the one of the developer has been open to reimbursing for nails and tires, and so we're going to forward all of those to the developer as they come in. But, again, I think it's... We have inspectors that are there daily, and part of their routine is to check for nails and so forth, so they're going to continue to do that. But I think we could do some additional street sweeping to try to get to this issue. Now, you and I have brainstormed on what else could we do. 
Um, we've talked about doing some additional sweeping in the neighborhoods as well to try to eliminate that as a source, perhaps. I, I actually polled the residents cause after our conversation this morning. So since this morning, I've received um, 140 replies for votes, 140 people have voted. And 104 votes said, no, they don't want extra street sweeping because all of the nails are on Glen Ranch and Saddleback Ranch Road where there are no homes. Um, it's it's pretty much no. I think I got I got 29 yeses to do a temporary, you know, everyone off the street to park. But but the consensus is it's it's not in the residential neighborhoods. It's all on Glen Ranch, Saddleback Ranch, El Toro. Okay. Well, given that information, I think we could still look at additional sweeping and additional monitoring. So we've definitely heard from you and some people in the community about this concern. So we will take it seriously. We are openly speaking with the developers. But again, we also have to weigh against it's very difficult to tie a nail to a specific site. But that doesn't mean we can't do additional sweeping. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Just along those lines. So with the so a street sweeper is going through, they're picking up debris such as this with the street sweeper or they're pushing it over to the curb or what, what exactly is occurring there? Um, yeah, street sweepers are, are sweeping it up and, and okay. vacuuming it up. Um, we have talked to our street sweeper about adding the, the magnetic bar, so I think that would be a, a next step. And uh, we'll, let's see what kind of debris we can, we can pick up and, and track down. So when they're cleaning out the debris that they pick up from the street sweeper, are they finding nails? I don't think we've gone through what they've, what they've picked up yet. I, I, I think that would be a very logical question to ask. You know, I, since, there, since all these individuals aren't here, you know, and I don't know them personally, I, I can only take it at, at, uh, at your word at, at what's occurring here. I, I, I'm highly concerned about the fact that you personally say that you've had two tires yourself and two from your husband, right? Mm -hmm. And I've had zero over the last, I don't know, 10 years living in Lake Forest. So there's clearly a problem there that needs to be addressed. Now, can you tie it back to a particular developer? Absolutely not. But I mean, that, that's a major concern, something that needs to, we need to do something about. I don't know exactly what that would be, but you know, it's at our last meeting, was it our last meeting we went and toured the uh, Civic Center site? And we humorously commented about the 100 feet of street out here that there's a street sweeper that's doing loops with, right? That seems completely ridiculous, all about dust control, but something that had to happen. The fact that we can't figure out how to get nails off the street and people are having pretty expensive problems, you know, a couple hundred dollars into the few hundred dollars per family, uh, you know, that, that's unacceptable in my mind. So, you know, it's again, I know that's not the agenda topic tonight, but something needs to be done about that, no doubt about it. And you have my full support with whatever you need. Thank you. Uh, I, I too, um, I spent 20 years in the construction industry. My dad was a superintendent. My brother just retired as a heavy equipment operator. Um, construction workers don't make a habit of dropping their nails on the streets because the fact is their vehicles get affected by it too. So. Um, Something's happening, obviously, with that many reports coming in. Um, I don't know these people, but the fact is that my councilwoman here says, but um, we as construction workers don't drop our nails. It's not something that we shoot nails into the street for, so people can get flat tires. And so um, it's just unheard of. In the 20 years that I was a construction worker, a carpenter working with nails, I only got one six penny nail in my tire one time in 20 years. Um, and that's driving through the job sites where the framing was going on, where the actually construction was going, not on the street. These streets we're talking about is Glen Ranch Road and Saddleback. The construction's not actually happening there unless someone's got his tailgate open and is dropping nails as he goes out of the gate. Um, it, there's, that, that this doesn't happen. So I just um, I, I think it's very odd and predict unpredictable that this is kind of happening. It's kind of a strange thing. So um, I would like to get to the bottom. Of, you know, a, a metal. Um, magnet on the bottom of those street sweepers because um, it's not fair for the construction workers or the contractors or the developers to get blamed for this when it's happening and it's not a, it's not a, a pattern that the contractor the workers on the job site do so um, 
I, I think that we, we need to have that metal, uh, that magnet on the bottom of that. Because if we're running it right now, um, that was a great question. You know, as they dumped it out, I mean, are there nails that you're finding in the in the trash? I mean, they can dump it out and kind of take a rake and kind of go through it a little bit. Um, and are these six pennies or sixteen pennies? What what kind of nails are being? These are questions that I'd like to have answered. So. I've actually seen pictures of it. It's on Facebook, and they're sixteen penny nails. They're sixteen, okay. Yeah, they're roofing nails. This one woman held two of them out that she pulled from her tires, and th I mean, they were the length of her hand. They were they were enormous nails. They were clearly roofing nails. Well, okay. Those aren't roofing nails, actually, but those the, are those. Well, are, but the, sorry. Those are framing nails. Framing, yeah. Sorry, framing. <laughs> All right, um, I, but I, I too, I, I support that we do more research than that. But okay, we will, other than that, I'll move the item. Okay, we definitely hear you, and so we, you. we will continue to report back. Thank you. Well, I'll second that, but just just to interfere and actually talk about the developer agreements for a second here. In the matrix page on the chart, you have on the first item, Portola Center, you have 308 units. 304 units, but the 79 and 223 only add up to 302. So somebody needs to go back and check that. And in that right-hand column, the final paragraph in the right-hand column is just a repeat of the paragraph in front of it, but it's not someone, they cut and paste something that shouldn't be there. So you should fix those on the, on the next version of the matrix. And with that, we can vote. Uh, I'll take that as a friendly amendment and, and move <laughs> item. Second. That motion carries unanimously. Okay, another public hearing. This one on the fiscal year CDBG consolidated annual performance submitted by Director of Community Development. I'll open the hearing, receive the staff report. Mayor, I'd like to introduce Ron Santos, Senior Planner, with the staff report this evening. Thank you. Evening, Mayor Gardner and City Council. The Consolidated Annual Evaluation Report, or CAPER, as it's known, is a federally required report that discusses how the city used CDBG funding to advance the goals and objectives of the city's consolidated plan. The report provides details regarding revenues, expenditures, and how the grant was used to benefit the community. As reported in the CAPER, the city utilized grant funds for the provision of various public services benefiting low and moderate income residents, for housing re rehabilitation loans, and for ADA sidewalk ramp constructions citywide. Staff is recommending that the council approve the CAPER and authorize its transmittal to HUD. This concludes staff's presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. And um, Mike Linares, who's the city's CDPG consultant, is also available. Okay, thank you. Do we have any public questions, comments? Not from the public, Your Honor. Facebook questions, comments? No, sir. No, let me, uh, well, I'll close the public hearing. And uh, my colleagues, let me say your graph was very helpful, very nicely laid out, and all the information was easily obtainable. Do we have any questions? Sorry. No? Sorry? sorry. <laughs> you don't have to be sorry, just say no. All right, then, uh, and again, really nice uh, presentation, and I'll move the item. Second. That motion carries unanimously. That matrix also was a very good, uh, helpful five pages of text or one chart, and it's, it's very good. Thank you for that. Um, well, that will... And the public hearings are now on to discussion items. Item 11, renaming the Parks and Recreation Commission, Community Services Commission. And I'm not sure we need a report for that. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah, Mayor, members of the council, this is just um, what effectuates the direction you gave us for the last meeting. It's adopting this ordinance actually would set in motion changing the name. Do I have a motion? I'll move. It's so moved. I'll second that. That motion carries unanimously. Uh, item number 12, Veterans Park Operations submitted by Director of Community Services, a.k.a. Parks and Recreation.
Mayor and members of the council, we have a report from our Director of Community Services, Scott Wasserman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Hopefully I'm not limited to three minutes up here. It's a little easier to give the presentation from, from here. Um, City Council is probably aware we are elated that we're approaching the end of the renovation project at Veterans Park. And if you've walked the park, then you're probably as excited as I am. And we think it's going to be really beautiful. We think uh, our residents are really going to enjoy it. And this item really pertains to the installation of a camera system. It's something that the city council asked us to explore. We brought something to you at the last meeting. You asked us to bid it out, and, and we've done that. And before we jump into that, I just want to give a little bit of background to talk about how we got to this point. Um, in the renovation project, we the city has really done its best to employ multiple strategies to address the impact of the animals on the facility. This is really what um, a good, good part of the renovation was about. And one of the strategies that we employed was habitat modification. And we achieved this primarily through the design process. And it's essentially just what it sounds like. It's modifying the habitat to make it less hospitable to waterfowl. And we did this by adding trees and fountain geysers to interfere with the flight patterns of the waterfowl the use of plant species not favored by waterfowl, the use of tall grasses to simulate a predator environment, removal of the concrete walkway around the perimeter of the pond to impede entry into the pond. Um, we will also replace the signage advising park visitors of the wildlife ordinance. We're also going to work with the PIO's office uh, to create a public education campaign to educate residents about the detrimental effects on both the animals and the facility of feeding the animals. In addition to habitat modification, we also are looking to include a wildlife mitigation plan. And this is something that we'll be bringing to council shortly after the park opens. Um, wildlife mitigation plan is something we work with the wildlife biologists to develop this. And it essentially, this is the plan that prevents a large waterfowl population from reestablishing itself in the park. Um, wildlife mitiga mitigation services generally consist of a wildlife biologists with whom the city contracts they go to the park. In this case, it would be on a weekly basis. They look and they see if there are any non-native species that need to be rehomed. And they also look for any, anything else that needs to be addressed. It could be aggressive animals. Um, anything dealing with the animal population is really what wildlife mitigation is about. Uh, so they provide regular monitoring of the park and animal population. That's going to be weekly. They remove and rehome aggressive animals and native species. They also grease eggs as needed. And the wildlife mitigation plan reflects a comprehensive approach and best practices identified by wildlife biologists to reduce the impact of the animals on the facility. This is essentially what we did not have for the last 40 years for the life of the park. So we had 40 years, an animal population that continued to grow. Um, it knew no other home other than in the park. And it was completely unmitigated. Uh, at a previous council meeting in June, the city council discussed Veterans Park operations and options to enforce the wildlife ordinance. Options include hiring a temporary code enforcement officer to patrol the park, park patrols provided by Orange County Animal Care. And at the city council's behest, we also explore the use of a camera surveillance system uh, to enforce the wildlife ordinance. And at this meeting, staff presented an estimate to install a camera system at Veterans Park for $40,000 and this consisted of two cameras and a server. Um, the server is needed to comply with record retention laws to retain the footage for a period of one year. And one camera would be placed over uh, the Veterans Monument, and the second camera would be facing Ridge Route, um, a portion of Ridge Route, basically the portion of Ridge Route that historically was used for drive up feeding. City Council direction at this meeting was to solicit bids for the proposed camera system to determine if we could achieve a cost savings. Uh, council also directed staff to agendize a discussion of the city's wildlife ordinance to potentially increase the citation amount. This is an item that's coming up on your agenda later this evening. And so tonight's discussion, I've worked up to this. Uh, the city, so we did rebid the program, the project. We. Staff revised the specifications a little bit to make the, the uh, specifications a little less stringent to achieve a cost savings while still retaining the quality of video footage that we would need in order for it to be usable. And staff bid this out. We received five bids. Uh, two of the bids were non-responsive. 
The bids range from 19,000 to 44,000, and the lowest responsive responsible bid was $20,000. Um, this is the cost breakout, and you'll notice that at the bottom there, I included the total of 24,000. The reason I did that, there are two items that are not provided by the vendor, and I added those in just to give council the full understanding of what the cost would be of the project. Um, so the web streaming, this is something that could allow uh, potentially crowdsourcing. It would allow individuals to log into the city's web page and view the view through the camera. Uh, the cameras are not monitored by staff, so we would be pretty much dependent on people to report things to us, where we would have to go back at a later date, review camera footage, and determine if it's actionable. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the electrical box. Public Works would need to purchase and install an electrical box to provide power to the cameras. Uh, you know what, let me back up. I should mention the source of funding would be the park development fund for the $24,000. This is the same source of funding that the city's used to fund the entire renovation project. Um, there are ongoing expenses with all of our cameras in our facilities, and this system is no different. Um, one of those would be $1,400 for the Verizon wireless service, and this is something that's needed when someone contacts community services and they ask us, for example, Yesterday at 3.30, I saw someone pull up in a red truck. They got out and they dumped 10 pounds of breadcrumbs and they got in their truck and drove away. Someone in community services would need to go back and review the footage. It's actually the wireless service that enables us to do that. Uh, we also have software licensing and have ongoing camera maintenance. So these are the picture on the left side here, the two cameras. This camera, if you look Closely, you can see one, two, three, four. That's actually four cameras in one. And you'll see what that view looks like. But it provides basically a 360 degree view right around the Veterans Monument. And then the camera right, right beneath that, that would be the camera that would be mounted on an existing pole near Ridge Route. And both of these cameras would be, would be mounted on existing poles, which means the city doesn't have to spend money, obviously, to, to purchase and install new poles. And this is what the cameras would cover. So this is the 360 degree view right over the Veterans Monument. And this, of course, would be the camera near Ridge Route. And the cameras could potentially allow us to enforce the ordinance in two ways. Um, one would be if someone pulls up and engages in drive-by feeding, and we capture this on camera, and it happens regularly at the same time of the day. For example, someone in a bakery truck pulls up every Monday at 3.30, and they do this. Um, the cameras might give us a clue as to who we're looking for and when we might want to deploy resources uh, to make contact with this individual. Um, the second thing the cameras would do, they're really like the cameras in our other park facilities where they are limited in the sense that in order to have something actionable to, to present to the Sheriff's Department for follow-up, the cameras need to capture the violation, um, someone feeding the animals, then we need to be able to identify the individuals. And the primary way that we've done this at the Etney Skate Park and the Sports Park would be through a vehicle license plate. And in this case, we can get a vehicle license plate if someone parks right up here. There have been a couple of instances at the Sports Park where we've identified individuals uh, through other means besides the license plate. One example would be someone who had a logo on their shirt. They wore their company's shirt while they were doing something they shouldn't have done. <laughs> Sheriff's Department where they were able to track them down. And my favorite was uh, someone that committed an act of vandalism using their boss's company car, great big logo on the side. <laughs> and again, the Sheriff's Department were able to track them down and hold them accountable. Um, but typically what would happen, since these cameras are not monitored, uh, someone would need to call in. They would call community services. And one of my staff members would review the footage and we would determine if we have enough actionable footage to forward to the Sheriff's Department for investigation. So again, actionable, actionable footage would include someone on video um, feeding the wildlife in violation of the ordinance and then some means of identifying them, which we hope would be a license plate. And I'm going to ask if, if uh, Lieutenant Valentine can talk a little bit about what happens once we hand that footage to you and how that's processed. Uh, Mayor and Council Members, so once, once the uh, city staff identifies footage that might have some uh, evidence of a crime or something like that in there, um, 
they would call the sheriff's department a deputy would come out and and take that report here at city hall and collect that video as evidence uh, and then from there that we would get forwarded to uh, sheriff's investigator out of our uh, saddleback substation um, from there depending on the information that's obtained you're looking at about four to twelve hours on average uh, to identify locate talk to and put the uh, case together to submit to either the district attorney or to the city attorney's office for filing for violating the city ordinance or vandalism it depends on what we're what we're dealing with um, so there's a lot of man hours involved in tracking that down so we just wanted to make sure we took the time to explain to you how that process would work a deputy would not come out uh, directly and, and issue a citation or arrest somebody uh, it's a misdemeanor and if it's not committed in their presence the legal way and the legal action is to go through that process I will now take any questions that you might have questions nothing from the public your honor uh, where's the server located the server would be you know should, let me go back to my perch over here Scott, could you re-answer that question into the microphone? Yes. For those watching at home, it's I, helpful. Using my yeah, my outdoor voice would work. Um, the question was, where is the server located? The server is located at the base of the pole, on which the camera will be installed right above the Veterans Monument. With, with the requirements that we have as a municipality when we tape, how long do we have to keep the tape for? We're required to retain the footage for a period of one year. Now, is that server that able to handle one year's worth of filming for the year? Yes. The, 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 the bid that we cited for $20,000 does include a server that's capable of retaining the footage for one year. So besides the $24,000 up front, what is the yearly annual total in? It's, we're estimating that at $3,400 at this time. So it's, it's about $1,000 for ongoing camera maintenance. That could be less, um, could be more. It just de depends on if, if someone vandalizes the cameras and, and what they need. Approximately $1,000 for annual software updates. And then approximately $1,400 $1, a year for the Verizon for the wireless contract. See, um, I, I favor the cameras up rather than having an extra code enforcement officer that patrolling the park because with the, the, the redesign of the park and what we've done, done to mitigate large congregations of geese, that was our main problem, from um, inhabiting a home there and laying their eggs and their offsprings, I think that um, this with the Veterans Monument, it protects the monument, but also gives us a sense of security because we'll get you know, if there is a action there, we have a camera there that could possibly catch some kind of evidence that a crime has been committed there. But I, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of, of having personnel that are um, other than maybe our stars driving by like they do in all our parks. And, and just to provide counsel with a little background, some of the options that we, we discussed at your last meeting essentially entailed putting boots on the ground, putting someone in the park that can enforce that ordinance that has the authority to issue citations, which could be a temporary uh, temporary code enforcement officer or uh, Orange County animal care personnel. So, so, but the fact when we open up, we're not going to even have any ducks here. So, I mean, what we're talking about is we could come back to next year and see what's happening, but we don't need to put boots on the ground at this point. The fact is, I think that with our signs, are we doing re new signage? We are doing new signage. We're going to have a public education campaign, and we, we believe that you're correct. We believe that that animal population that was in the park prior to the renovation, um, it's been all rehomed. Most of them have been adopted out. We don't expect a domestic population of animals to take up residence in the park on a permanent basis in that short amount of time. So as you said, um, our, our first recommendation was to wait and see what happens with the animal population? And I, I think that, you know, besides the signage, signage that says that this park is being videoed, I think that those are deterrents enough in the fact that we have the re-landscape to um, pro discourage mm -hmm. um, wildlife from, um, or geese and ducks there because of the predatory 
um, advantage they have with some of the high grass and stuff. I think that, I think we, it's a wait and see there, but the park, the, um, the camera system, um, I'm, I'm just supportive. Now, is there any concrete that's laid that we'd have to go through or it's all dirt right now? We laid some of the, we actually laid as much of the conduit, uh, conduit as we could. So there could be some minimal trenching, but that's already figured into the price. All right, thank you. But there's two things going on there, and I, I, I agree with you on the animal part of it, but the other one is the vandalism in the memorial That's where the camera area. would be good, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's different. That starts from day one. Uh, the other one, if you wanted to wait, you know, a month or two months or three months till it happened, oh, but... I mean, we could wait, but the the other cameras, that main camera is there for the memorial area. That's correct. I have a question about the location of the server. Mm -hmm. If we're going to be having a wireless service that's going to, we'll be able to access the information, you know, wirelessly, do we have to have the server on site? It would minimize vandalism of that as well and, and evidence. If we could have it at an off-site location, like for example, we, if you've got something going on at the sports park and it's already got a server for those cameras, can't we just group them all together in one place where just all access in that location? That's a great question. You know, I'm going to refer that. We have our IT manager with us this evening, Doug McBratney. Doug was very helpful. He facilitated the bid estimates, and he's probably much better at answering these questions than I am. Uh, hello, Mayor and members of the council. Well, first of all, I'm no uh, security camera expert, but in our research, we, uh, as we often do, we learned a little bit about the systems. And the um, the NVR, or the, the video recorder device, is commonly used as kind of a staging platform. So although you would not need a device big enough to store all one full year of video, you would need a device to store some video as it's staged and saved before it's pushed out to potential online storage or city hall storage. So we could have the server at a different location beyond where it, instead of being you, at Veterans Park? You could have a smaller server, a uh, less expensive server, but then you would need to have some other storage used once it got pushed off the local storage into remote storage. Okay. Yeah, it's just my concern is if we're going to be investing the money in it and someone's coming to deliberately vandalize the property, they would, they would probably think, well, where's the server to record this data? Because obviously I'm being videotaped and then they're damaging the cameras and the server and everything else. Yeah, take out the server first before you can So it's a good point, and Doug, please interject if, if you can add to this, but um, you raise a very good point. So the, the server, you look at the server at a park, it's not fortified, it's not weatherproof, it's not vandal-proof because it sits in a closet, mm -hmm. right, inside the facility. This is different because it has to be outside and the way that we've, we've specified this equipment is that it should be those things. It should be, I wouldn't say vandal-proof, but vandal-resistant, weatherproof, waterproof. Um, that's what drives the, the cost of, really the cost of the server is connected to um, its durability and also its ability to store the information for a period of one year. If it has to be on site, can it be camouflaged in a manner where it can't be identified that that's what it is? Like a coyote. A ca yeah, or a duck. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding. Well, um, I think you could you could build a, a footing and put it off to the side somewhere as long as we we might need to trench to that location. Um, the way you often see, you know, traffic control devices. Um, so that probably could be done. It obviously wasn't part of the scope of work, so we don't know what the cost would be. It's but it seems like an alternative. We could explore that. We have people who, I believe, would agree to host it. One of them lives here. One of them lives here. And uh, they can Mayor and members of the council, we talked to our insurance carrier and he spent a very long time telling us what a bad idea that is. <laughs> so I, I would recommend that we don't explore that for a variety of reasons. Okay. I support the camera. I think it's a great idea. I am concerned about vandalism, and I, I would support it if we can find a way to camouflage it, get it to a location where it's not obvious that that's what it is. Otherwise, I do support it. Is the, is the camera currently supposed to be at the base of the pole that holds the camera? 
the server? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it could be at the base of either pole. Okay. Actually, it could be at the base of, uh, of any pole where we could make that connection. Okay. So this just a, 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 for a, another connection, or, you know, another location, there's no, there's no concrete footing and it needs to be weatherproofed and other, and you know, other changes. Far away, we, I think the answer is that we can explore this with the vendor. The further away that we move it, the more trenching we have to do, which has the potential to tear up the sidewalk and, and cost a lot of money. So we would try to minimize that, but we can explore it. Yeah, even if, you, if you've got something at the base of whatever pole you're using and you kind of fortify the, the base and then hide it in there somehow, so it makes it rather, you know, vandal proof, that's, I would support that. And then how are we going to protect the cameras from being vandalized? Cameras are mounted up, well, the cameras are mounted up high where they're difficult to reach. I don't know that we can ever guarantee that any camera Not 100%, anywhere. But yeah, the, in any, if someone walks up with a bat or they throw rocks at the camera, it, you know, it's difficult to protect against that. Particularly the camera that's facing ridge route, I think you want to put it high enough so that it's out of the reach you know, of park visitors, but it needs to be low enough. The lower it is, the more effective it's going to be at getting license plates. Uh, and Mayor Gardner, the, um, the actual um, cameras are actually in a case, so mm -hmm. it's not just a, it's not hitting the lens. It could hit break the case maybe, but it wouldn't break the lens. Right. These cameras, I think, are different from the cameras that we have at the sports park, and that the cam the majority of cameras at the sports park are located really high off the ground. I think the exception might be the cameras that capture the license plates when people come in and out of the facility, but those are really rugged cameras. And one of the things that when we try to achieve a cost savings, um, we looked at the cameras and we reduced the specification for the cameras because we want them to be rugged and durable, um, but we, they don't need to cover the same distance that they do, you know, at, say, the sports park. And these, we've been told, are still durable, but we can't guarantee. Is it possible to station the cameras so that they look at each other? so that anybody damaging the one camera gets caught on the other camera. That might be possible with their Looks location. Like it might be a little, right, it might just be possible so we'd at least get them one way. Right, but we could always install a third uh, and fourth camera. That would, of course, increase the cost and have them pointed at each other to make sure that we have it completely covered. I think we could take that under advisement and talk to the vendor to the extent that we can. I, I agree. I think that's a good yeah, idea. Yeah, it looks like just we'll the try slightest little tweak. And yeah, we'll it do does. That. All right. I'll, yeah. I'll move the item with that friendly amendment to see if we can fortify the, the server, you know, to keep it safe. Well, we have a question from, uh, oh. question or a comment from Facebook Live. Yes, we do, sir. It's, it's uh, related to the item. Uh, Mr. Ronald Newman asks, are the lights going to stay on in the park all night long? Some of the lights are less than 30 feet from residents. It seems like an excessive amount of lights to be on all night. Mayor and members of the council, the lights will be on all night. Uh, we can work with how bright they are, but because for security reasons, they are on all night. And that's standard with our parks. Okay. Is, it, uh, is that person still on? Like the is it that it's shining directly on their house? Like, what's the nature of the problem? Maybe we could adjust something so it doesn't shine. If, if I may, Mayor and, and Council members, um, the lights aren't in their final configuration yet. There's some tweaking that we can do that we are doing. We've been in contact with two neighbors. Oh, okay. Once we did turn on the lights, so we're working with them. We're, we need to turn some of the lights that we can do. And then also there's some shields that we can put on the lights also. So we're researching that. Perfect. Good. You know, if you if you got in touch, if you let the HOA Julie know about that, she could let. There's about 20 people who live there. Oh, well, we're, we're in touch. Oh, you're in touch. <laughs> all, all the residents know us very well. Okay, great. <laughs> Good. All right. I think we had a a motion and a second. Uh, well, the recommended action is actually council discretion. So I w I want to lay out what I think I heard from the council on this item. Um, through discussion. So you'd like to move forward with the cameras. Uh, you'd like us to explore whether we can move the server to increase its security. Um, and to the extent possible, we can um, protect the cameras from vandalism and try to turn one of the cameras so it faces the other 
for that same purpose for increasing the securities of the camera. Correct. Sounds perfect. Is that your motion? <laughs> no, I believe that's Leah's motion. Okay. I second that. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Oh, please vote. That motion carries unanimously. Okay, and then the other issue is the um, the fine, which originally was a hundred dollars, and then uh, Mr. Dunnick took pity on grandmothers, I believe it was, and reduced it to fifty dollars. And I believe we gave out three in three years, three tickets. And then the question is, do we want to increase the fine back to a hundred dollars, or do we want to do the roving a hundred dollars first time, two hundred dollars second time, five hundred dollars third time? Council, if I if I could just add something, um, council certainly has a discretion to increase the fine. I think that one of the reasons that we set a fixed fine, just one fixed fine, and we didn't have the different fines for the you know progressive number of offenses, was that it was difficult to track. So, for example, if code enforcement is out there, if the sheriff's issue a citation, if um, someone from animal care issues a citation it would be difficult for everyone to really communicate if this person's had a citation before. Um, I just wanted to offer that as a reasoning as to why that was changed. So why does that sound so difficult? If we, if one, three jurisdictions, three agencies have to communicate, it, <laughs> it, it, it is <laughs> possible. <laughs> <laughs> just have a sleeve somewhere that says fill the twelve box citation. You know, I, 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 I'll make the motion that we just keep it at fifty dollars and move forward because of the fact is I, I don't see a lot of geese and ducks hanging out there anymore, and so um, a lot of it's just on speculation. So um, I, I'm fine with fifty dollars fine and just leave it at that. Yeah. Oh, we have another com comment on the new issue. Yeah, go ahead. Dino Roman, comment for council. Feeding the fowl is something you will never stop. It's something little kids do everywhere. Look at the zoos and wild animal parks. Discourage bringing their own unhealthy food by installing feeders where for a couple of quarters you can get a handful of feed that's healthy for the fowl. Finding is not the way to go. I like yeah, it. This, isn't, this isn't designed, it was never designed for the Mr. Dunnick's grandmother and their grandchild. They are feeding the ducks. What it was designed for is, I believe there's about 10 to 25 people who show up in cars with trunks full of bread. So it's really designed for, which is why it's there and there's not cameras anywhere. So it's a very specific population who contribute those large amounts of bread, which is toxic to the animals and also creates the overpopulation. So no one's going to go around stopping anybody from you know, f feeding a duck or a goose, but it's that, it's the cars and the trunks that we're looking at. That was actually, a, it's a really good idea to install feeders, except then we're now encouraging people to feed the animals. <laughs> so we probably don't want to do that. But I'd, I'd like to make a friendly amendment. I think we should increase the fine to $100, and I think we should have signs posted that says $100 fine for feeding animals. Because the key, the point I want to make is we don't want to have to find people. We don't want people to be feeding the animals. And if you give it, it's a nominal fine, people disregard it. But if it's like, ouch, $100, that could hurt. Maybe they won't feed the, the animals. That's our goal, is to, to not be issuing these citations. So let's kind of put the fear of God in them a little. Yeah, I prefer the 100 myself. That's ouch. 50 is uh, 100. So I'll support your substitute motion. Any other comments or questions? All right, then we'll vote on the substitute motion first. Uh, the substitute motion, I was hoping, can include a sign that says a $100 fine for feeding the animals. Yes, yeah, so what your motion would be would be to adopt the resolution with $100 specified as the citation amount. Okay, please vote. So, what, 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 oh, it, 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 so if Grandma brings their grandson and granddaughter and they feed no, grandma's it. not going. Grandma's not going to get a ticket. It's, it's really designed for the people. Well, the, the cause. Fee, no fee. That's up to the discretion of the officers. Yes, know. right. But, but this the fact is, it's still a hundred dollars fine. I mean, when we're talking fifty dollars, hundred dollars, that that is a, still a big fine. I mean, fifty dollar fine. And but the police aren't patrolling it, looking for grandmothers feeding geese. Okay. Just the grandmother. 
But I mean, there's nobody. Do you have the people to go patrol the park looking for geese feeders? Mayor and council members, uh, the way I would answer this question is simply, uh, simply put that the law would be equally applied. So if we are called there for a call for service regarding somebody feeding the wildlife, whether that's somebody unloading trunk loads of bread or grandma with her two grandchildren, the law would be equally applied. My point, per, per, you, thank you, uh, Lieutenant Bell. That's the way it's written, and that's that's why we would. A, so, a sign saying no feeding the animals says no feeding the animals. So if grandma and grandma have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and the kids start throwing it, I mean, we're talking about a $100 fine. If they're throwing a peanut butter sandwich to the geese, they deserve a hundred dollar fine because that'll kill the geese. I mean, we, it's it's a, just a point is to be a deterrent. If you're telling people we're going to fine you a hundred dollars, people will think twice before feeding them. That's what we're trying to do is prevent the feeding from happening to begin with. Yeah, and I don't. I just don't. Uh, I don't think if you if you're called, <laughs> your guys have nothing else to do. If they're called to go to the park, because somebody's feeding a duck they're going to get over there I don't think so the other system where they have the license plate etc is a system that would work but that would be a really low priority call yeah, we, we don't want those calls to happen we just want people to not feed the animals yeah, yeah. Anyway, you well let's see and if it happened if we start giving uh, right. if we start giving people that happens let's and we can consider reducing yeah, we can always reduce All right, well, there's a motion on the floor, and that is the $100 straight fine and posting it. And vote, please. That motion carries unanimously. All right, city manager's report. I just have one item briefly. I'd like to apologize to the mayor for my choice of words about placing a server on public property. I should have said it's problematic, not it's a bad idea. So I apologize for that. Also, I, I have choice bad ideas. My wife tells me all the time. That's a, <laughs> yes, no reason so, to apologize. I took the city manager oath, so poor choice of words on my part. Um, the second update, I'd just like to remind the community that Shop and Dine is starting, and in two weeks we're going to have the Taste of Lake Forest over at the Foothill Town Center. So just keep that in mind and more announcements to come on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, starting on my, let me start on my left, Councilman Voigt. Um, I attended the California League of Cities last week um, and participated with uh, many of the breakout sessions. Um, they talked about homelessness and marijuana because the new law will be enacted in less than nine months now to where marijuana will be legal. So um, um, that was a great informative meeting and I have nothing further. Okay, thank you. Go to Councilman Robinson. Uh, I just want to commend the staff on putting together a great event at uh, Heroes Park. Um, what was that two Sundays ago? Um, I, I felt like it was appropriate. I felt like um, it was very impactful. I feel like you've done a great job. Uh, the responses that I think we all received from the family were very favorable. I'm very appreciative and. Uh, you know, I've, I've lived in town since uh, January of 1999 and uh, got married in April. My wife joined me. Um, we wanted to make Lake Forest our home. Just a few months later, we were, we were living in the Timbers, the apartment complex at, at Rockfield and Ridge Route. And uh, just a few months into my wife living there, six months into myself, uh, Officer Riches um, was fatally shot at the 7-Eleven right down the street. And uh, you know, our, our first thought was, what what's going on in Lake Forest? Is this a safe community? And we we quickly realized from the candlelight vigil that occurred and just the community pulling together that this was something that first of all was was very abnormal and something that um, brought the community together. And uh, we knew that this was the place for us. So you know, we spent. We've spent the last 18 years here. We're raising our children here. <laughs> um, one of the first council meetings that I attended, um, at the time, Mayor Richard Dixon uh, was presiding. And uh, he had a very emotional um, uh, agenda item that he wanted to bring forth, and that was to rename the park there to Heroes Park. And uh, 
after the activities of September 11th. So, you know, for me, that event was kind of bringing full circle a few of my very early interactions with the city. Um, I was very pleased to see that happen. Um, I think Colonel Cagley did a fantastic job of, of, uh, of memorializing, commemorating um, one of the soldiers. And uh, so yeah, I just felt like it was a great event. I want to compliment all of you on that. And uh, I'm glad that we have those opportunities. There's a lot of times where it feels like there's some disunity here. That was, that was one where, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of unity. We're all unified, focused on the same thing. And, and you know, so just want to compliment all of you. And that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Cadley. Thank you, thank you, Councilman Robinson. Just a couple of things. One is I think we should honor the uh, folks from San Clemente because it, it does impact on us and, and investigate or look into the TCA. It, it seems like it's out of its, out of its um, area of um, jurisdiction, for lack of a better word. And, so you uh, want some, well, you need to, how many consensees? Got mine. Got mine. Just one? Okay. The second thing is um, when the city manager sent us all this thing on the uh, community block grant pr program. I was very Im impressed with the map that was came along showing the areas that have 48 percent of uh, lower moderate income households. The ones along the corridor I-5 corridor and then up uh, near the 241. The ones along I-5, that's that's an area that concerns me. I'm, I'm there a lot now because of my wife and where she is, but it's it's an area that we're seeing more and more, I think, I'm sensing more and more disturbances and crowding, and that's where the, some of the parking issues are. So I think the city needs to keep an eye on that and, and find ways to do to uh, work on it. And Tom, thank you for sending out the, the tree trimmers. They did improve Lavaca Street considerably last week, and I appreciate it very much. Um, finally, in closing, uh, a little bit lighthearted, uh, you know, if we would have a retreat every night with a 105 howitzer, it would keep, keep the birds away from our guarantee. For sure. <laughs> thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Coincidentally, I happen to live at the Timbers Apartments in 1999 as well. We probably pass each other in the hallways. That's very funny. Um, it just kind of brought to my attention about Vaca Street. I remember a, a disabled lady had come to a meeting about a month ago or so and was saying she was having trouble because um, her ride chair was having trouble finding parking on the street to pick her up, and she was hoping you could do something. Well, I went to go visit uh, Tom's wife, Nancy, and in front of this lady's house was a blue stripe handicap strip. That was just the coolest thing ever. I'd never seen that before. I know we got to see manager's update on it, but to see it in person and to see how quickly you guys responded and took care of that resident's need, that was pretty awesome. So just thank you for listening and I'll get in touch with you about the light synchronization for Saddleback Ranch Road. And to the city manager, thank you for hearing us up there on the hill and thank you that we're going to get something done. And oh my gosh, it's 8 o'clock and we get to leave. Have a wonderful night. Okay, on that basis, then I'll thank everybody for being here, and we'll see you in two weeks.